Hello. Thank you all for coming. As you might have realized, I'm not Steve Poole. <laughs> and the talk is not the one that is scheduled for this lot. Unfortunately, uh, Steve Poole cannot come. Uh, he, he had a problem. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to, to do on his behalf this slot of a completely different uh, topic. Title of the title of the talk is Your Program as a Transpiler. So I assume that either you wanted to see a lot Steve Poole or the title was catchy enough. So the title for today, the topic for today is to improve application performance by applying compiler design. Hope you like it. But uh, assuming also that you are coming here for Steve Pool, I have to say who I am. So my name is Eduardo Vacchi. I am uh, from Milan, Italy. This is my handle, Evacchi. You can find me on Twitter, GitHub, whatever. And uh, currently I work at the Drools and JBPM team at Red Hat, as you can notice from the hat. And uh, before that, I did research for programming languages and uh, programming language implementation at uh, University of Milan. And also, I worked uh, together with a Horsa company. A few people from there are here today. Hello. And, um, <laughs> and uh, we worked together still on the compiler and the compilers and the domain specific languages. Then, after that, I, I went to Unicredit Research and Development. There are a few people from there too, so hello. And now I'm here in Red Hat doing a lot of interesting stuff, uh, some of those you'll see in this talk. So as I said, uh, I, I, I've been for a while in academia, so some of it stuck with me. Uh, I've been told for a lot of time that it's important to start every single talk you do with a motivation. So here's the motivation for this talk. Um, so, language implementation sometimes is seen as some sort of dark art, something that's black magic, something that is complicated, something that is hard to grasp. But uh, to be fair, some design patterns are actually simple at the core. And that's why we're here. I want to show you some of these design patterns and show you how the, you actually can uh, improve your own code in a regular application that is not a compiler by using those simple patterns. Uh, and in particular, because Graal VM, Substrate VM, and these new technologies are becoming more and more relevant, um, you'll see how thinking differently of your code uh, might give you really quick performance wins. Uh, the topic I want to focus today is uh, boot time versus runtime. Uh, in, in every program that we write, there is always a preprocessing phase where we prepare uh, we prepare the inputs, we prepare our program to start, and, and then there's the actual execution phase. So basically the goals for today is to understand if we can factor preprocessing out of the program runtime. And then once we've done that, it's to answer this other question, can we actually factor it out of our program? So, Here's our running example. Uh, I assume that most people here are familiar with dependence injection. In dependence injection, we, you, you may use XML configuration files, but in this case, annotations. Um, we're saying here that we're injecting an animal interface and the implementation is given. Uh, we might have several implementation for the animal interface. Uh, one of those is dog, and uh, this dog uh, implementation is annotated with inject candidate. So our expectation is that through some coding machinery, uh, we, are, we, we can instantiate our example class and then get the animal instance, which will be a dog instance. So basically, th this API is kind of um, inspired uh, from juice, if you've ever seen that. Um, so you instantiate a class, a binder that uh, instantiates your classes and uh, uses the annotations to perform the bindings. So in this case, we have the example, we have a getter for the animal interface, and we can assert that it's, that it's not null, and that uh, it's an instance of dog. This, will, this should work. The, the code for all of the examples you see here it at, is on GitHub, my GitHub there. Um, this should work, we assume so. So if you had to, if, hello? If you ever had to write this, 
Um, I think you could, you could write it on your own because I assume most people here are familiar with reflection. How many people are familiar with reflection here? Okay, that's enough, I'd say. So I assume you can basically write it yourself. Uh, the only thing that's a bit boring to write, but you could write on your own, is the first few lines with reflections, uh, the, the class path scanning part. So I, the idea would be that you would scan your class path looking for annotation and, and then find the bindings. So um, this part can be done manually. You can find a lot of documentation on the net on how to do that. Uh, but you can use also a library like this one, reflections. And this will just use class path scanning looking for annotations. That's all. So this code, you could write it. Now, uh, let's take, uh, this is not, this is, these are not benchmarks, okay? So we have people here that are experts in benchmarks. These are not benchmarks. We're just timing the execution time of JVM just for one, one time. So it's anything but um, scientific. But it gives you a good, a good estimate, right? Uh, at least of the order of magnitude for the runtime of this simple program, it takes a little bit under three seconds. So it's not much, but it's not that little, is it? So, but we might say, well, three seconds is not that much if our program is long running, right? If, it, if it's a program that's going to take days to run, it will stay, it will stay up for hours, days, weeks, then whatever, three seconds are affordable. But in our brand new age where we have microservices and serverless and things that scale up, scale down, they, they can be started uh, every, at any time, we expect these things to, to, um, to go up very fast. So three seconds, it's not that little. And that's where GraalVM comes uh, in the picture. So how many people today have attended a, a talk that included GraalVM? Okay, not that many. So just a few words about GraalVM. GraalVM is the one VM to rule them all. That's an actual title. It's the title of the, one of the seminal papers for this technology. It's, 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 it might be defined and might be described as the new generation for the J, JVM, but it's uh, much more than that because it also supports a lot of different languages. And it's, it provides even a, um, a high-level API to implement your own programming language with, with performance that are really comparable and, and uh, um, really uh, close uh, to, the, to the real world implementation, to the standard implementation of, uh, of those languages. For instance, JavaScript uh, for GraalVM, uh, which is called Truffle JavaScript, I think, um, it's basically almost as fast as V8. And it's implemented in a much higher level way. So it's really interesting, but it's not that we're going to focus on today, because today we're going to focus on uh, the same technology stack, which allows for uh, ahead of time compilation. So you can take your, JV, your Java language or JVM language, your JVM program, and compile it through uh, Substrate VM, the native uh, image binary executable, and get a standalone executable that will run without a JVM. Um, this is a really, really simple example. It's a boring hello world. We're all allowed, to, we all know how to write. And as you can see, if we run it through Java C and then we time it, on my machine, it will take a little over 200 milliseconds. If we compile it with a native image executable, the native image compiler from GraalVM, it will take one millisecond, right? So I, I, I've done nothing. I took the same program and run it through the native image compiler. So at this point, we might ask to ourselves, well, I have an application that takes three seconds to run. Um, can I get better performance by just running native image? Nope. We can't. We can't because uh, there, are a few, there are a few limitations for, with the native image compiler. So sorry if I went too, too fast. Uh, so this is the compilation for, the, for, for our previous example. It breaks. It's not necessary that you take a look at the, at the stack trace. It's not really interesting. Uh, the point is uh, we are doing reflection there. And this is basically disallowed uh, in, the, in the native image compiler. Well, I'm actually lying. It is not disallowed. It's just limited. Uh, it is, 
unrestricted reflection is disallowed. There's a closed word assumption, which means you have to know up front all of the classes that you're going to reflect upon. You have to declare it to the compiler. So there's a limitation. Um, it's not that severe, but it's there. So at this point, you might ask, uh, what does this to do with the with transpiler that you have in your title? Right. So first, uh, first we have to, to, to say something about compilers then, because uh, if you want to know what a compiler, what a transpiler is, you also have to know what a compiler is. So what's a compiler? A compiler is, is just a program that takes uh, source code written in some programming language, and then it translates it into a semantically equivalent program written using another programming language. In, most, in many cases, um, this uh, target language is also a lower level language than the one that it's the source code written in. But this is, well, okay. That's why we use the word transpiler to indicate a particular kind of program that takes as an input uh, source code and then translates it into another language semantically equivalent program that is written in, a high, in another higher level language. So people usually say a, a language at the same level of abstraction. It's another word to say source to source translator. But uh, now the question is, are transpilers simpler than com compilers? So uh, if the difference is only the level of abstraction of the target language, are they really that different uh, at their core? Uh, these are uh, a bunch of myths that, that I want to dis discuss today. So some people might say, well, uh, a compiler, it's a proper compiler only for targets a lower level language, and therefore it's complicated because lower level languages are complicated. No, they're not. They're not. They're actually very, very simple. So uh, it is boring to take a higher level language and translate it into a lot of code in a lower level language. Because that's what a compiler does. It takes little code and it expands it into a lot of code. So it's not really complicated. It's more boring. So I would say that this is not true. Um, then one might say, OK, but uh, what if my transpiler only expands syntactic sugar? What's syntactic sugar? Well, syntactic sugar is a concise construct that gets expanded into more code so that I don't have to write it. Oh wait, but that's what the compiler does. It takes little code and expands it into a lot of code. So that's another point in favor of not calling a transpiler. But proper compilers do low level optimizations. I can't call my transpiler a compiler if it doesn't do optimizations. Well, you can, because you're thinking of an optimizing compiler. Uh, usually, we think of compilers as the same as optimizing compiler because most, most compilers are also optimizing compilers. For instance, GCC produces optimized code, and then we think that's a proper compiler. But it's not in the definition of compiler that you have to produce optimized code. So that's an optimizing compiler. You can do a compiler that is not producing optimized code and just call it a compiler. So the distinction, to me at least, is moot. Uh, they're pretty much the same thing. And actually, I think the, the, using the word transpiler, is, uh, it's, it's counterproductive. Because it tends to be used sometimes to, to, to just justify that the compiler is not that much good. Uh, no, no, it's simple. It's just a transpiler. Um, you, can, you can say it's a transpiler, so you, you're safe. You're, it's not something complicated. But the problem is uh, to write a good compiler is just as much work as writing a good transpiler. So let's just call it a, transpiler, a compiler, right? So how do we write a good compiler? So the title of this talk is now Your Program as a Compiler. Now, we should be pretty much in the actual discussion now. So. What does it mean to think of your program as if it were a compiler? Uh, 
there are at least two classes of problems that we can uh, solve by thinking of our program as a compiler. One is data transformation problems, and the other is boot time optimization problem. If you think of a Spark pipeline, a Spark pipeline is done uh, by defining a lot of operations that are concatenated together. You describe your program. Then this program is uh, evaluated and transformed into an execution plan. That's also what a, what a database does. So I think this is also useful for our everyday programming task, if we could think of our programs that way. But it's not the thing that we're going to focus today. As I said at the beginning, we're thinking of boot time optimization problems. So first of all, in order to improve your boot time, you have to recognize your compilation phase. Right. But in my regular program, which is not a compiler, what's a compilation phase? It is your setup phase. It's a phase where we we were talking at the beginning, it's the phase where you prepare your program to run. It's the phase that you do at the beginning, and you do it only once before processing actually begins. So the question now here is, so if you do it only once, do you really have to do it every single time your program runs? For instance, uh, configuring your application. Will that configuration change over time? Um, or maybe, do you have to repackage your application each time you deploy it? That repackaging takes time. Can you take that time and spend a little more of time there instead of, of your runtime? And do something there instead of the runtime? Or our running example, dependency injection. So you're building an immutable dockerized microservice in the cloud. And it's all immutable, it's all packaged. It's in a JVM, it's in a jar, it's in a Docker, it's in a container, it's in a virtual machine, it's in the cloud. You won't ever touch it at runtime. Your class path will not change. So why are you using runtime reflection? There's no reason your class path can change in that context. So why are you using runtime reflection? Why are you using runtime dependence injection? Well, well we, because, because it's only once, right? But never, never doing it at runtime. It's better than doing it only once. And, uh, but it's flexible. I can change it without recompiling my whole program. Yes, but you're spending a lot of time in CI and CD pipelines. So what, what if you spend a little more time there instead of at runtime? Especially considering that this thing break. These things break for configuration problems. And sometimes you will never know up until your program has started. So you're taking a lot of time to wait for your program to start just to, to, to see that it won't run because it's misconfigured. So can we validate our configuration somewhere else, not at runtime? Oh, and there, well, that's just reiterating the same concept. I, I guess ma many people here have uh, had their, their fair share of, uh, of problems with uh, runtime dependence injection, trying to debug and understand what the f heck we're trying, was trying to do their framework of choice. So once we realize we have this problem, um, we, we say uh, we, we, we can go to step two. And uh, hello. And, uh, and, uh, and decide to work like a compiler. So what does working like a compiler mean? So a compiler does a whole bunch of things, um, but we cannot go much into the details of that. But basically, it takes uh, your source code of a program, it parses it, it constructs an in-memory uh, data structure, and then um, this in-memory data structure is, is refined a lot of time up until we can go to the, to the actual uh, representation, a target representation, that is, the, the, the output code, right? In particular, I want to focus on this. The uh, internal data structures is refined through intermediate representations. Uh, we can describe it in another way. Um, the process of, of compiling a program is first collecting your resources, finding, finding possibly the dependencies between the resources, building this data structure, for instance, a graph, for instance, a tree, some, something, then visiting the, this structure many times. That's the intermediate representation. You can visit this data structure as many times as you like. And then finally, you generate the source code, generate the code, you execute the program, whatever. So 
I would say that what makes a, prop, a compiler, a proper compiler, is not generating low-level code, is not generating, uh, is not doing optimizations, it's compilation phases. So that's basically the whole point of the whole talk. If you want to go out now, please do not. <laughs> But that's the whole point today, uh, to, to get you to start thinking about your code uh, as if it were uh, doing processing phases. It doesn't work every single time, but it might work a lot of time. There's a misconception here, too. Uh, people tend to think that doing uh, one pass, and in during this pass, doing a lot of things, it's better than doing many passes and doing only one thing per each pass. I let it land it for a, long, for a minute. So it, it, it kind of seems, I don't know, to some people it sounds counterintuitive, but it's actually pretty intuitive because the complexity is exactly the same, right? So you're visiting the same data structure a lot of times, uh, or you're visiting the data structure once and doing many things once. It's the same. Moreover, if you do separate compiler passes, you get better separation of concerns, which has, a, 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 as programmers, we like it a lot. And you get better testability, because then you can test every single compiler pass. You can test the input of one phase and the output of that phase, and then the, the input of the next phase, which will be the output of the previous, and the output of that phase, and so on and so forth, and verify that you're not screwing up in the middle which you cannot do if you're doing one single pass. We should think it's pretty interesting. And, that, and then you can also choose when and where each phase goes, where each phase goes, uh, uh, gets evaluated. A few examples, go, I'm going through these uh, quickly. Um, you read a file from the class path, you unmarshal the file into a typed object, you resolve includes, you resolve variables, you validate the data types. These are my phases. Another example, an ORM library like Hibernate in Quarkus. <laughs> we have Sana here. I hope you, are, you went to his talk. Um, well, uh, I, I just assume that there are a few phases here, like, for instance, scanning class path for annotation, find a relationship between classes, fetch the DB catalog, synthesize prepared statements, synthesize entity implementations, and maybe many others, and just making these up. I'm not sure a Hibernate works like this, but this is what I will do. And our running example are DA frameworks. So you scan the class for annotation, you find a relationship between classes, you verify the dependencies are satisfied, you find a cycle-free path, because you don't want your dependencies to be circular. And then you synthesize factories. That's one idea. You, you might come up with others. So let's get back a little bit to our running example. Um, notice this, this line, scan. It's the line where the class path scanning is done. So we're using here this, this uh, reflections library. Um, and in the create instance, we are doing uh, uh, another bunch of, uh, another little bunch of stuff. As you might notice, let me get back a little, create instance will be done every single time you instantiate a class. This might be done at every point in your program, everywhere. So, uh, what I want to show you here is that at runtime, you might miss, if you do many things at runtime, you might miss complexity that gets pushed into your runtime. That's why thinking about phases is important. Because maybe you're spending a lot of time, you're, you're taking time in your runtime to do things that you could push to the beginning of your program and doing only once when the program starts. Oh. And, and please notice that the reflections library here is quite heavy. Please do it only once. So you, you, we could refactor the scan phase, the scan, the scan method with many phases here. So first you instantiate the reflection, then you resolve injection candidates, you resolve injected constructors, you collect the candidates, you resolve the mappings there so that the create instance method will not do a whole bunch of stuff looking for annotation. It will just instantiate. So through these, we have now made our compilation, fa compilation phases more apparent, and runtime will not be affected. And please notice that class path scanning is still heavy, so please do not do it more than once, because it will be wasteful. 
But now we have at least found the, the, the concerns that make up uh, the preparation of our, of our program. Now the question would be, do we really need to scan the class pet at each single startup? And then at this point, that's the third step, which, is, which, is, which really it's optional at this point. Now you have already done a lot of work. You have pushed work that you might have done at runtime wastefully at the beginning of your program. So your program will take maybe a little more to run, uh, to, to start, but then it will take less to run, which is still, which is still good, right? Now the, the, the subsequent step would be to remove that part from your runtime altogether, not do that things uh, that you do once inside your program. So how would you do that? Well, let's see. Uh, at the bottom left, we have, again, our usual example, the, 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 the running example that we saw at the beginning. And on the right, we have other code. You'll see, you, can, uh, you can reach that, uh, again, on GitHub. You'll see the whole source code. It will work. And um, uh, at, at the right-hand side, at the bottom, uh, there's code that uses generated code. As you can see, it's basically the same exact uh, lines of code, except there's no more scanning. And imagine if the class at the bottom was the, the binder. You recall the binder, how it was written. There were, there were a lot of reflection there. Um, here, it's just the thing that you would write if you would code a factory by hand. This could be, code, this could be generated automatically. So how would you do that? Well, if you want to generate code, please, please, for the love of God, do not come caden at strings use a proper library to produce code. There are quite a few. There are type safe APIs that you can use to generate code. Um, that you can generate source code with a bunch of those, Java Poet. Or if, if you want to generate bytecode, you can use ByteBuddy, ASM, and other things that we'll see in a bit. You don't like APIs, you prefer templating. Well, use templating, whatever. String format is, even better, is still better than doing string concatenation. Then once you've done that, uh, for instance, in our, in, our, in our running example, the code that you'll see online, I've used Java Parser that regardless of the name, despite the name, it's actually also useful to generate code. It provides a fluent API to generate code. And then, once you have a way to produce Java source classes that you can compile, you can write a build plugin. So you generate the source code, then you pl plug into your Maven build and let Maven do the rest. Or you could write an annotation processor, which is independent of your build tool. Or you could write a Quarkus extension, which is even more convenient because uh, it provides you tools uh, to avoid explicitly writing code um, yourself. Uh, I can't go uh, into the details of that. I hope you watched. The, you, take, took, um, you attended the talk by Sanne because I'm sure he, he showed you uh, a lot of details in that regard. I just wanted to mention it for completeness. Uh, in, a, in my case, because I prepared a few, few days ago this talk and I didn't have time to write a Quarkus extension, I wrote an annotation processor. Um, and uh, well, you can find also source code uh, online. As you can see here, you can precisely notice that there are the phases that we talked about. Pro process injection candidates, process injection sites, generate Java sources, and um, there's something hidden, which is the part where you scan class but for annotation, which you won't do because the annotation processor will do it for you. Now we can get back to our running example and see the running time. So as you recall, our example took a little bit under three seconds on the JVM. And it could not be compiled into native binary because it used reflection. So the question here is, uh, how fast does the code generated uh, sorry how fast does the code generated version runs on the jvm okay on the jvm this is not native binary it takes already two orders of magnitude less it's 87 milliseconds but now because this version is code generated and it does not use any kind of reflection we can compile it through the native image and now it will take three milliseconds for free. I have uh, some more time that I can take to show you a case study. 
uh, which is the work that we're doing at the Drools JBPM um, and the OptPlanner uh, teams. The name of the initiative is Submarine, and it comes from, the, from this quote. The question of whether a computer can think is no more interesting than the question of whether a submarine can swim by Dijkstra. Uh, why this quote? It's weird. It's weird. It is weird. Uh, it's because uh, it, this, this, is a, this is a quote about uh, artificial intelligence. So is a computer intelligent? Does a submarine can swim? Uh, the, is, is a submarine able to swim? It's, it's the wrong question, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun quote uh, with, with which we dubbed the, the new generation of the, 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 the new initiative with, with which I, we're trying to modernizing our AI and automation platform. And I'm using the word AI, artificial intelligence here in a broad, in a, with a broad meaning. Uh, it's because, for instance, um, parts of our, our automation platform is, uh, is uh, composed of, uh, of uh, uh, project uh, that do artificial intelligence, but in particular, Drews, it's a, um, I can say, traditional kind of artificial intelligence. It's logic-based artificial intelligence because it's a rule engine. There are also ways to uh, compute uh, models, which will be the modern AI concept. And then we have a workflow platform called JBPM and OptaPlanner, which is a constraint solver. I'm going to show you the first two because those are the ones I am collaborating uh, to. So I won't delve into the details of those, but Drews has a DSL, which is the one at the top, which lets you describe rules that are triggered when a particular event um, enters the, the program. Um, these rules are written in, in this DSL, and at the bottom we have this workflow engine called JBPM. JBPM, JBPM also is programmed through a DSL, but it's a graphical DSL. You might not notice that DSLs might be graphical. So this is a graphical DSL. That is, it's a diagram. And it has a serialized representation in format of an XML, but it's a DSL. It has its own grammar in the form or types of nodes. And it's actually executable code, just like the one above. Uh, the, the nodes may contain code that can be executed. So um, in our current, um, our current implementation, these files, these scripts, get parsed at the, at the startup time, at parsing, uh, sorry, at startup time. So when you start a Drools JBPM uh, program, it scans your class path, looking for files for uh, Drools, files for JPM, and it loads them. So this takes quite a while, right? Uh, because you have to parse it, you have to validate them. Uh, so the class path, both the class path scanning and both evaluating these files takes a lot of ta precious time from your boot up time uh, of your application. So this is how it currently works. So what we did is translating the DRL, which is the Drews rule language, in Java code in our, in, our, in our case, but basically byte code. And we do the same thing. It's not important that you actually read the code. It's equivalent Java code. Um, and the same we did with JBPM. So instead of requiring the runtime, uh, the runtime of our program to parse each and every single time uh, our, our scripts, we compile them down to a binary representation and then we load them at runtime, already parsed, already ready to be evaluated. And this is where Quarkus come into the picture because now we have a program that natively can run inside Quarkus. We're also developing extension to have a better integration with a Quarkus runtime, but we already have a lot of benefits because now we are sure that our program can run in the JVM with a very fast, fast startup time because we have shaved that away by generating code, uh, but also because we do not use reflection, we do not fancy things with, uh, with our files, we can also compile them down to, to a binary image and get even better start of time. So conclusions. Do more in your pre-processing phase, that is, your compiled time, and do less during the processing phase, that is, your runtime. In other words, try and separate what you can do once from what you have to do repeatedly. And especially, process 
in phases. Because if you can process in phases, if you can factor your, factor your preparation time in phases, then maybe you might have the chance to move all or some of your phases to compile time and get better performance at startup time and then maybe compile it with Growl and Quarkus and have even better startup time. These are the resources, some links, uh, my name, my GitHub handle, and Twitter handle, and that is all from me. <laughs> are there any questions? Yes? So the question is, uh, if, I, uh, if, we, if some people here are familiar with Shapeless, which is a Scala library, uh, it, it's, it's well known to take a long time to, it, it, it enlarges a lot, it makes bigger a lot um, your, your compile time in a Scala program. Um, and uh, so the question would be, if you're moving a lot of processing outside your runtime and inside your compile time, you're taking much longer time to compile uh, your program and then you, it will take a lot to, you're moving, you're moving the problem, right? So uh, I, I'm actually familiar with Shapeless and I actually did uh, talk about Shapeless in uh, Scala Italy a few years ago, um, mostly for academic reason because it's really fun as a library. So the problem with Shapeless, uh, there are a few problems with Shapeless. Um, the Scala compiler is much more powerful than Java compiler because it allows for make macros. Um, macros allows you to do code generation at compile time um, and it's much more powerful than actually generating code using um, string concatenation or actually rolling your own code generation routines because it's provided by the language itself. So you don't have to actually roll, roll your own. But um, on the other hand, uh, uh, Shapeless, it's also using a lot of type machinery and because the Scala, the Scala type, um, type system is much more powerful than the Java type system. And actually, uh, Shapeless was born as, a, as an experiment to push the boundaries of the, of the um, type system of Scala. So that's why uh, Miles Sabin, which is the main author, uh, plays with the compiler a lot, provides patches, because that's part of the fun. So, um, I believe that moving part of your problem in compile time will make larger your compile time, but I think that Java is a sufficiently simple language. It's not that simple, but it's simpler than, than Scala, and uh, that, that it will not affect that much your, your program. And in particular, I think that uh, Shapeless is, is a probably a particularly bad example because it tries to really push the boundaries there. Um, uh, because I think that you can do macro expansion in Scala with less impact on, on your compile time. But thanks for the question. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you then.